I noticed the first small thing was in, in, in another movie two years before that. Uh, I believe he worked on some of the effects of that movie, The Golden Child. Do we have morphing in that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, there was a, a little morphing. A rat morphing into um, a British actor, which is in, in Game of Thrones. He used to do the villain in the movie. Okay, I'll check it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I was involved. Maybe I was. I'm not sure. But it would have been a sort of a one-off. We also had a wire removal around that time too, a digital that that had never been done before, too. The Abyss a été le premier film à avoir une scène avec de l'image de synthèse entièrement budgétée. Right, but we, all, we you know, that's, it had been done before, because, well, Flight of the Navigator was done somewhere in there, and Last Starfighter, and they had their own budgets and everything to work on, and a lot, you know, a lot of shots to do too. But we were working with Jim Cameron, and our stuff, and I wanted it to look absolutely real. So it, it was, uh, it did only, we had six months to do about 17 shots or so. Uh, it was pretty hard to pull it off and then into the photo reel in that time. But we do it, we made it. C'est impressionnant. Et j'attends toujours que ça sorte officiellement en HD. Yeah, <laughs> or Ultra, what's the, they're calling it something else now. Ultra something or other coming. 4K, it will be 4K, yeah. Intéressant. Concernant Terminator 2, c'était un peu le même type d'effet, comme vous le savez, avec la réflexion de l'environnement. Mais à quel degré votre expérience sur le pseudopode d'Abyss vous a-t-elle aidé pour superviser la création du T-1000 Uh, to get ready for something else, and it turned out to be, you know, T2. We also got for T2, we got digital compositing. So there's no map line around the characters or anything like that that we've seen before. But around that time, there had been some commercials that had been done that I'd seen on television and some research stuff that had been done at universities with chrome figures and CG, and you could see, yeah, you know, it's, it's possible because you're not, you're not dealing with any skin, any surface, you're just dealing with a reflection. Same with the abyss. And that relieves a lot of the problems of having to make something look like it really fits. You know, it brings it down to really the design of it, the animation, the flexibility of the design. And like we had a lot of stuff in T2 where we had to make sure the geometry didn't rip apart. And we had, I walked in one day, and we had a, like about eight people looking at a chalkboard with algorithms all on it. And these were like physicists practically or mathematicians that had been brought in to solve the problem just of the tearing geometry. And at times, we, there were some shots in the film, the, the daily that came back did tear, especially at the shoulder. At one of the times when the T-1000s were running through the parking lot. I just come out of the elevator, running along, and we got these big gashing tears in there. And I didn't want to re-render the shot. I didn't want to really even solve the problem. So we photoshopped those, just painted, Doug Chang painted. But it was only two or three frames. It wasn't that hard to do it. Because just occasionally something would go wrong, you know. But that was kind of my secret weapon to get that shot done and the whole show done. Because you know, not everything worked perfect, but usually you could fix everything with paint on top of it. And I think if we hadn't have had that set up at that time and working, it would have been foolish to have tried the show. I don't think we ever anybody could have done it. Passons à Jurassic Park. Je crois savoir qu'au début, seule la scène de poursuite avec les Galiminus était prévue. Yeah, originally, yeah, yeah. right, right. Comment est-ce que Steven Spielberg voulait-il que vous produisiez cette scène à l'origine He didn't even, he hadn't told us about the scene, but we had had a computer graphic group. There were some other shows, I think it was maybe Death Becomes or might have been going on, but there was some stuff happening around that time too. We started looking, is there, what are computers good at? And Phil Tippett had the job to do it all in stop motion, and he was building all the puppets and everything for it. Then we got into uh, the idea, well, if we could try something computer, you know, let's see what we can do. What are computers good at? Well, they're replicating. So if there was some sort of sequence where there were a lot of animals in it, it would be perfect for computers because Phil could never do it. It would be too hard for him to make a lot of puppets and animate them all and everything. And I mentioned this to Steven, and he said, well, funny you mentioned that. But that he would, uh, thinking about cutting it out of the film, but it's a stampede sequence with all these animals. So that was great. Okay, so we'll try it. At the same time, we had Mark DePay and Steve Williams are working there, and they were just saying, you know, I think we can do this stuff. And I didn't, I wasn't so sure about it. I looked at a lot of research that had been done, a lot of stuff the universities had been done on computer graphics, and looked for skins, 
because people were making like snakes and they were making stuff like that. And nothing looked real. And it didn't have anything to do with the animation because Steve's a great animator, you know you could do that. But it's the solidity of it. So it looks like an object and not like something, you know, created out of computer. Steve did this walking skeleton, which came out really good and we got some money to try to skin it. And we did that and we, I tell you, we went out and visited zoos and everything to see what they look like. I did a lot of uh, photographs of an actual model shot outside of the T-Rex and to see how the lighting looks, how the skin looks and all that sort of stuff. Stefan Fangmeyer did a lot of work on the lighting on it and when we put the skin on the walking one, it just was like, this was amazing. And we've never seen anything like it. And so then we had to tell Phil, Phil, you know, uh, but we made sure Phil was still working on the show. En tant que superviseur des dinosaures, oui. Oh, but his crew, his crew worked on it. Yeah. I mean, his crew did two sequences. They did the, most of the kitchen sequence, not all, and they did, I think they did the T-Rex in the rain. Most of that, but not all of that. So it really brought him up to the point when three years later he could do Starship Troopers. You know, he really had it all. Hello again. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the lip syncing in uh, T-1002, which um, I believe premiered in uh, the ABS when uh, Elizabeth Mastrotonio like smiles in the um, on the ball. How did the team that you managed manage to do that particular smile on the pseudo ball by 1989? I think John Knoll was involved in that, especially in solving that problem on the abyss and uh, we talked, actually had the actor in there uh, shot some footage and some still photos and used the depth map just out of brightness to be able to come up with the topography of it and the other stuff was the thing to get out I think is what goes on to too. There's not much talking in that film but it's probably the same sort of approach. You know? It's great stuff. <laughs>